All right, the sound is going really good today so far. Um, hope everybody's doing good. This is not Skid Row or whatever other cuss words that uh, your classmates want to share over the Zoom. Um, so please follow these directions to set up your Lecture 9 in-class coding. And while you're doing that, I will point out uh, that all of the solutions for coding challenges one through three, as well as labs one through four, are available on the course website. So you can go on there and review those and learn from them if you're struggling with those specific assignments. So once you have uh, this done, and you do that command ls star, you should have these files in your folder. So give me a thumbs up when you have that set up and ready to go. It's on, the directions are on the course webpage. It's just the same thing. You're gonna run a, a wget command like so. Then you change the permissions to be able to run the setup script. And then you will actually uh, run the script and it will download everything else for you. In the meantime, I will turn down the volume just a little so we don't have as much reverb. So what we're going to work on first is we are going to build off of this idea of doubly linked lists. And we learned briefly about queues. A queue is a first in, first out data structure. It's the exact opposite of a stack. So with the stack, we learned that we aggregated with a singly linked list. And with the queue, we are going to aggregate a doubly linked list. So what we're going to do is we're going to let the work that we've already developed with a doubly linked list do the work for us. So when we do pop and push, it's actually just the same thing as push front and push back or pop, uh, pop front, things that we've already discussed with the doubly linked list. Now the benefit this allows us to do is we can use queues to keep track of certain things in a specific order. And the most prominent example of this is a algorithm called breadth first search. We're gonna cover it a little bit today and we're gonna cover it in a lot more detail when we get into graph theory in the second half of the course. The general idea behind breadth first search is we use the queue to keep track of directions that we've used to potentially go through a maze. So like a, if you were in a cornfield, you would probably use depth, what's known as depth first search. You make one decision, you make one decision until you hit a wall and then you come back and try another path. Breadth first search would be like if you were looking at a map, where you could consider several different paths and say, well, this looks right, and you keep going until you find a specific solution. And so a queue is very beneficial for breadth first search. And we're actually going to use the instruction stack when we get into graph theory in order to do depth first search. So we're going to take advantage of our knowledge of stacks and our knowledge of the computer architecture to be able to implement those algorithms. So this particular problem, it's an interview challenge problem. It's a lead code problem. And the general idea is that you're given a maze. And if the value is one, you can go. And if it's zero, you can't. And your goal is to find the shortest path between the origin and a specific location. And using breadth first search, we're going to implement a rudimentary version of an algorithm known as Dijkstra's algorithm, which allows us to be able to do this. So, our rules are we have M rows by N columns. We have zero is a valid move. I mean, zero is invalid, one is a valid move. So in C, if you were doing this, you would have to allocate everything with an integer pointer pointer, and then you would have to constantly check these for ranges. You'd have to pass those. And remember when you were doing pass by reference of the arrays, it can be pretty complicated. In object-oriented programming with a vector, of which we're actually going to design our own later this lecture, we can actually call the standard vector by reference, which will allow us to be able to just use the size method to so significantly reduce the complexity for us. So the whole idea behind breadth first search, and so we have a little maze, and we're going to learn about this. This is an example of a unidirectional graph. And we start at one, and in this particular problem, I want to try to figure out the shortest path between one and eight. And so here's how we use a queue. 
One's outgoing to nodes two, three, and four, right? And so what I would do is I would evaluate at node one. And then what I would do is I would put the outgoing nodes of where I can go into a queue. So that you see at the bottom, uh, bottom left, your left, it's two, three, and four. So then what I would do is I say, all right, I haven't found eight. So two is gonna be at the front of the queue. I'm gonna pop that off the front of the queue and all of the outgoing nodes from two are gonna be put at the back of the queue. So what you're gonna see is two is gonna be removed and then five and six are gonna be at the back. So then we outvaluated again from three. Three doesn't have any outgoing values, so we just leave it be. Now four is at the front, and then I evaluate it. I look at all the outgoing values. I see that eight is one of the values. When I found it, that is the shortest path. So it's one, four, and eight. And so we're gonna write an example of this for the first problem. And so here's how it would actually work in animation. So I start here at zero, zero, and the value in red, the red box is where I'm trying to get to. So it can be really complicated, but actually when we break it down, it's the exact same process. So no matter how big the graph, we can use the same algorithm to solve the problem. So here I just have this red box that's gonna show which direction I need to go in. And I'm gonna go in the same order each time I'm gonna go, I'm gonna look to the right, up, down, and, and then left. So the node that I'm starting out is zero and zero, and that third value is the distance because the problem is gonna ask for the distance as well. So we need to keep track of this. And so I check down, it's zero, so I can't go. I have a second array that I keep track of all the visited values. I look to the right, I can do that. So now that's gonna end up getting put in the queue. And we see that zero comma one with a distance of one because we've moved from the origin to that value is there. I look up, we can't go there because that has exceeded the bound of the maze and the same thing with left. So now I remove the origin from the queue and then check that zero comma one. And then I look down I can put that in there, that's in the queue. One comma one is the location and two is the distance. So I can get the, the distance between these two values. I look to the right, it's valid. I put that value in the queue. I look up, I can't go there. And I look left and I can't go there because it's already been visited. So then I would do the same thing one comma one is the first value that I put into the queue. So we're gonna evaluate this here. Once it's here, it means I've removed it from the queue. And now we're gonna do the same thing. It can't go here, it can go there, it can't go there because we've already visited it, and it can't go here because that's the value of zero. We'll go through that process. And then I'll put one, two, a zero, two, two, which is this one there. Can't go there because it's already been visited. Then we look to the right, we have that, put that in the queue. Can't go up, can't go down. Then we'll do one comma two again, or not, not again, but we see that it has a traversal of three and we do the same procedure. And we keep going on until one of three things happens. Either we have checked every possible location and the way we know we've checked every possible location is that every time we evaluate, we put elements into the queue. And then we keep going and then we get to that next location, we put more elements into the queue. So the only way we can say that we have checked every possible valid location that can be reached is if the queue is empty. So we can take advantage of our knowledge that the queue is built upon a doubly linked list that has a head and tail pointer and if it's not pointing to any values and it's empty, that means our traversal produced, we did not find the location. There is no valid path. We exceed the maximum length. So the maximum length, since we have M rows and N columns, the maximum length is M times N minus one. 
So once we do that, that means we cannot, I'm sorry, m times n plus one. So once we get to that maximum length, we have now have a scenario where we've gone through every single possible, the, the worst case scenario, and we didn't find it. Or, I'm sorry, it did say the queue is empty. And the last part is, if we actually find it, did we actually find the element? So if we encounter one of these three scenarios, we've solved the problem. So we're leaving the maze conditions. Row can't be less than zero or can't be greater than M. Column can't be less than zero or greater than N. And the cell has to be true, so we're gonna say one or zero. So the way I start out, and what I would like you to do is, we're gonna walk through together. Oh, that's not what I want you to see. That's resume stuff. What I want you to do is in the folder that you've created, in the source folder, please open the file shortestpath.cpp. And we'll walk through bit by bit until we get to the part that we're gonna to code together. So the first thing I have done, you can see that I've included the queue that we built last lecture. And then I have a struct that I call search node. The search node is the struct that I'm gonna to use to template the queue. So each search node has the origin, the destination and the distance. So that way when I'm running the algorithm, I can keep track of what the distance was when I initially evaluated that node. Does that make sense? So I keep track of that information. You see that I have a default and an overloaded constructor. The next thing I'm gonna do is I have this method is valid. So I'm bringing in a matrix and that matrix, instead of having to do int pointer pointer and do all this complicated work, I'm creating a vector of vector of ints. So now I get a square, just like an array and array in integers. And so here I'm calling by reference. And that again, gives us a benefit of reduced memory. And with C++, it reduces the coding complexity. So then I have matrix and visited, and then I have row and column, and then I have all of those conditions that I mentioned in the previous slide here. So return row val is greater than zero, and the row val is less than the size, so we mentioned that condition. The column val is greater than or equal to zero, and it has to be less than that size as well. And the, valid, the value at matrix rho val, rho val call val has to be one. So that's the second to last and condition and it can't already be visited. So that's our condition. So we have a question in the Slack. Is the distance from the origin, is it the distance from the origin or the last number visited? It's the distance from the origin. So that origin is where we will start and that's what the distance value is gonna be. And so the breadth for search algorithm, we start out with an origin and a destination of integers, as well as our matrix. And so I just have a little printout statement that says searching from the origin to the destination. And I'll say, if the origin is false, then the matrix can't be solved. So if I'm trying to find a, a uh, path from one place to another place, but I can't get to the first place, it shouldn't be a valid solution. And so then I would just print out the origin is inaccessible. And so what I have done here, and so what I'd like to do is I'm gonna scroll down to how I've initialized it. So in C, you would have had to do int star star and then allocate all the memory and then allocate each subarray. And then you'd have to do all these complicated initializers. Here, what I've done for a vector is I've created one vector for the first row, and then I pushed back onto the vector, and then the whole maze, I did the exact same thing. So I'm using the pushback, which we're gonna learn about later today, and I'm letting the data structure do the work for me. Once you've constructed a good data structure, you, it should be simple to implement that code. Right? So that's what we're doing here to set up the maze. So what I'd like to show you next here, I just call breadth first search. I pass the matrix, the origin is zero, zero, and the destination is seven, five. And then I just say, well, well okay, I'll explain this in a little bit. So now the next thing I've done 
is here inside the Brett first search, I've created another maze of visited and they're all zeros. That means nothing's been visited yet. So this allows us to be able to run the other part of the breadth first search algorithm. The next thing I'd like to show you is that I have our queue. I created a queue, it's our own class, and I've templated it to the struct search node. And we're gonna do that same process. And here, because I can say that we have a I can actually reach the origin because it's a one in the in the original value. I'm now going to set visited to true. So that way we don't unintentionally get in a loop and say, all right, I can find this path over back to the origin. I should not be able to do that. So that's why we're going to start it that way. Then I do something interesting here. And I'm going to explain to you what I'm doing at line 90. So when I push an element, what I am saying here is in the constructor for the overloaded constructor for a search node, it contains two elements, an origin and a destination. So if I go up to the copy constructor, we see that the copy constructor takes in two values. So what I'm doing at line 90 is I'm saying, all right, I'm going to construct a search node object, and I'm going to push it onto the queue. Does that make sense? So we're going to see that again on Thursday when we start dealing with hash tables. This is something that is done commonly with hash tables. So at line 90, we are constructing an object and pushing it onto the queue. And because we defined it as const in the overloaded constructor, we are allowed to do this. We're temp creating a temporary object and then the C++ const keyword creates a new one for us. Does that make sense? So now we can use these little C++ shortcuts because of our good design practices that we've learned so far this semester. And so what I've done is now we set up our minimum distance with the array of M and uh, times N plus one. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start coding together. So if you haven't already, please go to line 100 in this file. And what we're going to do is we're going to work through those cases in breadth first search to be able to produce the solution. So I'll give you a moment to do that. And so with breadth first search, the first thing you do is you grab the element at the front and then you remove it. Does that make sense? So we have put an element already, the origin node into the queue. So what will happen is we'll take it out and it will be empty, but we can then evaluate the, uh, the, the locations around the, around the origin. It will put those elements in, and if we can't find anything, meaning there's no way to leave the origin, then there's no valid path. Does that make sense? So that's what I mean when I say the, about the elements about the queue. So the first thing we're gonna do is I want you to write search node and we're gonna call it front search node. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna set that equal to the element at the front of the queue. So we're gonna call it the queue dot front. And then the second part is, well, we've got the copy, so now we're gonna pop the element off the front of the queue. And I see there's a question in the Slack. So I'll get to it in just a moment. So the queue dot pop. So now we've grabbed the element from the front and we removed it. So the question is, if we're at location A and find two possible paths, do we check B first? And that is what I'm gonna go over in a lot more detail here in a moment. Um, for breadth first search, there is a specific ordering that you have to choose. And so that becomes really important in graph theory. If we already have a possible location, do we add those possible locations to, to the back? If it has not already been visited, that's why we keep track of this other visited uh, matrix. We're, we're gonna go over that in more and more detail. So what we're now gonna do is we're gonna keep track of two iterators. I call them iter and jitter, J-T-E-R. 
And then we're going to keep track of a distance. And so what I'm going to say is I'm going to say int iter is equal to front search node dot x. And since it's a struct, we can do that. Int jitter is equal to front search node dot y. And dis int distance is equal to front search node dot distance, D-I-S-T. So now this allows us to keep track of all of those specific locations. So now that we've set this up, the first thing we should do is check if we've actually reached the destination. What happens if we get a case where they asked us that the origin and the destination are the same? So I'm going to say if iter is equal to destination x, dest underscore x is what we pass to the function, right? And jitter is equal to destination y. So inside that, we're going to say min dist is equal to distance. So now we've indicated that the distance is equal to what we had in the previous node. And then I want you to put in a break statement. So for those of you who've tend done the lab, we, and for those of you familiar with break statements from fundamentals of computing, we have a while loop or a for loop or something like that. And if we hit that break statement, it ends the while loop, even if the while loop condition itself hasn't been met. So now the second case in Matilda, this is going to be uh, more in depth into answering your question. So we want to check for all four elements. And so what you're going to see is that the first one we're going to walk through and the second and third and fourth are going to be very similar. It's just picking which directions we're going to go. And so what I did is I had an is valid method. So I'm going to say if, and the is valid method I showed you very briefly, but we pass it, pass this information to the is valid function, and it determines whether or not it's valid for us to move. You all remember that? We're going to call that function, I'm sorry, not func method, function. We're say is valid matrix comma visited. Make sure I spelled visited correctly. And then we're going to check down. So it's going to be iter plus one and then jitter. All right, so we got And then if you want to put in a comment, we'll say check down. And then if that's the case, if that's true, if we can travel there, then we're going to say that visited, the, that visited matrix is going to become true. And the way we do that, it's the same thing, iter plus one and jitter. So this is one way to do it. You can also do dot at iter plus one dot at jitter. And then the last part, let me scroll down a little bit. You say the Q dot push and now we're going to create a new search node. Iter plus one, jitter, and then front search node dot dist plus one. So let me scroll out just a little bit so that way we got everything right. And that's the line of code there. And so what I've done is I've created a search node. I said, all right, here's the next location. So we've said that the next location, we've looked down, iter plus one, jitter, and then we're adding one because that means that we've gone from that location to the next location. All right, does anybody have any questions about check down? Yes. I'm sorry, what? Uh, this, oh, this should be uh, your good catch. That should be equals true.
Any other questions? So while you're all finishing that up, I'm gonna describe the next step. We looked down and now I'm gonna to point to your right. And so right means that we're gonna do iter and jitter plus one. So down was iter plus one and jitter. To the right is iter plus one, but it's on the same column. So jitter is gonna be the same, but it's the exact same thing. Does that make sense? All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'll quickly do a little copy and paste and make those changes. And so we'll say check right. And we'll say, and we'll get rid of this iter plus one here and we'll do jitter plus one. And here this should be iter, jitter plus one. And this should be iter, jitter plus one. But it's the same thing otherwise because we're adding to the distance and we're still checking if it's valid. So if I'm look, if I go down and I've done to the right, what should up be? Anybody have any guesses as to what up should be in, in involving the iter and jitter? So if down is iter plus one and jitter and to the right is, yes, in the back. Very good, exactly right. So we're gonna check up. Let me scroll here so that you can see. And so this should be iter minus one, iter minus one, and iter minus one here. And so that is valid ensures that we don't exceed the boundaries of the matrix. So very good. And so let me do check up. And so if that's the case for check up, what should check left be? Your left, my right. What, what, what is the iter and jitter there? Yes. Very good. Iter is the same, and that's now it's going to be jitter minus one. Outstanding. So let me do check left, and we'll do iter and then jitter minus one. Oh, and so for those of you who maybe made a mistake while typing this out, I do want to point out that the uh, code will, is going to be available online. And so that way, if you have an issue and you compile it and you want to go back through, you can view that before tonight's submission deadline. Yes. I'm sorry, move the, move the item what? The reason why we have to set it to true is to prevent us from revisiting a location multiple times. So what's gonna happen is in that method, this is valid method that I presented a little earlier, it actually checks to see if that visited method has already, if we've already visited that location. So it only goes inside there if we haven't visited it already. So the whole purpose of that is to ensure we don't get an infinite loop. Did I address your question? Four different what? Oh, we don't, we, because we're going to be, the, the whole goal of the breadth first search is to ensure that we don't have to make a new matrix every time. So what's happening is it's iterating through, we're calling those two matrices by reference, so the, the goal is if you're doing graph stuff, the worst case scenario is it blows up on you with a lot of overhead, right? Yes. It was at the beginning of the, of the file. I presented it at, earlier. It's a, it's a, it is a uh, struct at the beginning. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Yes, it should be jitter minus one. Great. I, I was about to fix it and I was addressing, I uh, answer a couple of questions. Yes. I'm sorry, can you speak up? Yeah. Absolutely right. 
All right, so in the Slack, if iter represents x, why is iter plus one down and not right? Because we are representing rows and columns. So uh, Kristen, that's why, because we have to represent rows and columns there. All right, so once we do that, now, once we get to the end, this logic says, if we haven't exceeded the distance, we have found the valid distance. Okay. So let me save that. And we're going to compile and run it. So the way you do that is to make prob one. Oh, I'm sorry, make shortest path. We see that everything we've done to compile, and if you've done it correctly, it should produce length of 12. So make shortest path and length of 12. And so uh, we have a reply here. It says, I believe it represents rows and not the column. So that is uh, the follow-up. It's the same thing there. The other thing I want you to check, so if this worked, if you press ls, you will see a file there that is shown up called problem1.txt. That's just a way that when we run the script towards the end of the lecture, that we'll be able to see that you've uh, completed that portion of the in-class assignment. All right, does anybody have any other questions about this? So this is a kind of an introduction to breadth first search. We're gonna spend a, almost an entire lecture on this algorithm later in the semester when we get to graphs and that ordering will become very clear and we have to deal with multiple vertices and multiple edges. For now, it's, we're gonna look down to the right, up and to the left. And eventually what's gonna happen is this. So let me show you the next animation and hopefully, uh, Kristen, this should address your question. So I go through here, here's all the code you can look at as well. And then here's the output. You'll see prob1.txt and that's what actually comes out. That's the actual path. So we can see that the actual correct answer is in fact 12. Hey, does anybody have any other questions? Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do before we dive into actually learning how a standard vector works underneath the hood, there are a couple of important concepts about runtime complexity that I'd like to go over. So I know that several of you are currently taking discrete, so we can't go like too, de too uh, in depth into what's going on here, but the general idea is that we can use something called big O notation to keep track of what we're gonna say is the worst case scenario of a particular operation. So it's gonna be the up, we're gonna call it upper bound. No matter how bad it gets, it will never work worse than this specific notation that we're gonna use. And I am going to spend the next several minutes breaking down this particular statement. It says big O of G of N equals F of N, where there exists positive constants C and edge sub zero such that zero is less than or equal to F of N is less than or equal to C times G of N for all N greater than or equal to zero. If nothing of what I just said makes sense, that's fine. We're gonna break this down, okay? Well, what this does is this says, all right, G of N is some sort of a runtime. And if I multiply it by some sort of constant, it will relate to the actual runtime of my problem. And what this allows me to do is it allows me to justify how a specific algorithm works. Uh, and by the way, uh, Kristen, did, that, did my final follow-up address your question? Please let me know. So what does that mean? We can't go into too much detail in an algorithms course after you've learned several things in discrete mathematics, you'll be able to learn about something called a recurrence relation where you can formally figure out what's going on. For our purposes in the data structures course, a good a guess will allow us to be able to figure out any problem that you'll be presented. So I'm gonna show you what you should do and how to figure out what you should guess. I, I'm glad to hear it, Kristen. 
So here's a piece of code. I have a for loop, I have another for loop, I have some sort of addition, and then after that, I have a while loop, right? And so the for loop goes from zero to M. The next for loop goes from J equals zero to array length. And then the final, final while loop is while M is greater than or greater than zero, M is less than or e, uh, divided by or equal to two. So how do we actually tell what the worst case scenario is? So I say that we're gonna assume that M and array length are integers. And so we're gonna break down piece by piece what's actually going on here. We're gonna say that this particular line of code in red, k plus equals array of i of j, runs in what's known as constant time. And what I mean by that is, no matter how big the array is, i and j can be huge. They can be three, they can be 10,000, a million. I'm gonna make the case that no matter how big the array is, I can do it in three editions every single time it is constant. And how do we do that? Well, we can use all this knowledge that we've done with void pointers. With a void pointer, we know that a void pointer is pointing to a specific location and that an array is the beginning of a set of another pointer. So we broke down this star array plus i, that gets us the base address of the of that location in the array. And then I add again, and that gives me the location that it's pointing to next. So that's the second addition. Then I bring it in, I dereference it, and then we perform that k plus equals, and that's where I get the third addition. So, let me go through an animation real quick to justify my claim. So here we have this code. And then we're setting it up and we have int star star. What's going on is I say, all right, I put a register for length is equal to three and width is equal to three. And then I'm gonna do this int star star. And we see that val malloc length times size of int star malloc returns void pointer. So right now, all it's doing is it's pointing somewhere on the data heap. Then I wanna say, all right, time size of int with an m dash m64, we know that's gonna be 64 bits, times length, which is three. So I'm gonna have three integer pointers. So when I multiply int uh, malloc and then cast it to int star star, I now know that I have three integer pointers. So that is adding information to the void pointer. So then we get to this for loop. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take advantage of this to store the information on the data heap. So here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna allocate that first pointer now has memory that it's pointing to. And then this for loop, I'm using pointers. So there we allocate the memory for integers, 32 bits. And then I iterate through and then here I'm iter plus jitter, I'm casting to int. But what I'm doing is I'm using that to store information. You see that? So then I go back here, I create another location. So I'm pointing to that integer pointer. I'm now pointing to this location and then I update those values. And then I do the same thing for the third one. We allocate memory and we do the same thing, right? So now here are my three additions. This is why I say it's constant time. I wanna get len val and width val, so it's one and two. And then here is the procedural approach. First, we say array plus len val and dereference gives us that integer pointer that's marked with a red box in the top right corner. From there, I add width val and dereference that, and that gets me the value three, because that is the array one, two. So that's my second addition, and then I bring it in. So now if we go up the levels of abstraction, that's the same thing with array with the operators. And then if we do the same thing with a vector, and I use the dot at values, underneath the hood, it's the same thing, but the code is less complex but it's the same concept. 
three additions, no matter how big the arrays are, no matter how big the vectors are, constant time. All right, does anybody have any questions about that before I continue into this big O notation? Yeah, I don't see anything in the Slack either. So the moral there, a strong understanding of void pointers and procedural level will help you justify what's going on at a algorithmic level. So the next thing, so right now inside, I just have big O of three. I know it's three additions, right? The next step is now we go to the next level, we go to the next loop. So there I say, all right, zero to array length. So it'd be array, total of array length iterations, right? We don't know how long array length is gonna be. We have to consider worst case scenarios for big O. So now it's gonna be three times array length operations. Does that make sense? And then we go to this third level and it's M. So we have M, we multiply that. So it's three times array length times M. So then I go here. When you divide something by two every time, let's say I have 64, right? 64 goes to 32, goes to 16, eight, four, two, one, and zero. So this is what's known as log base two. You will often see this abbreviated as LG. And so everything that's inside here, it's three times array length times M plus log base two of M. Okay. So now we have this, we've done all this work. What does this actually mean? So this worst case scenario, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the variable name N to replace everything that we've encountered to come up with a generic worst case scenario where you say, okay, worst case scenario for all these possible variables, what's gonna be the result here? So we see it's three, we're replacing array length M with N. So we have three times N times N plus log base two of N. And that becomes three N squared plus log squared N. All right, so uh, Nikita, uh, the three, that's where we, I did that animation with the uh, array, array I, J, and K. So we had to do the pointer arithmetic. So we do two pointer additions every time and then the third one. So that does the animation I was going through. That's why, that, that was my case to, to, to claim three. Did that address your question? Awesome. Okay, so now we're going back to this equation here. What we just solved for when we got this 3n squared is this f, right? That's our f of n. That is our function. That is what this actually does. So now it's, we have to say, figure out what a generic worst case scenario is. And so again, I just want to say we're going to make guesses and you'll learn a more formal approach out in the algorithms course. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, all right, I'm gonna take a guess that my constant on a multiplied G of N is gonna be four. And that N of zero is going to be, uh, uh, so that G of N is gonna be N squared. So here I have this equation. I'm saying, okay, maybe four N squared will always be greater than three N squared plus log N. Let's see how this works out for me. So then log N squared, when I subtract three N, log n of one is gonna be zero. And so this means here that I'm gonna say n sub zero is equal to one. And there's, that's the valid thing that I can put into that in order to make it work. Because we know that two to the zero is equal to one, which is how we get this. So what this means is log squared n is going to be less than or equal to n squared for all values greater than or equal to one. Does that make sense? So now what we can claim is the following. Four times n squared, that other n squared, that's g of n, and that's our solution. 
n squared is known as quadratic time. And so we say that big O of g of n such that f of n, where we have f of n is less than or equal to that constant c times g of n for all values greater than n sub zero. So what we derive by going through our code is that our actual function is 3n squared plus log 2 of n. And we proved that 4 times n squared is always going to be greater than or equal to that for all values greater than 1. Therefore, we remove the constant big O of n squared. Does everybody see that? Therefore, we can claim that no matter how big array length gets or how big m gets, it will work no worse than quadratic time. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, nothing in the room. I'm going to go check the Slack. Okay, don't see anything else there. The solution is big O of n squared. So let's work through another one. So we're going to say that m and l, well, I, I've uh, m and k, excuse me. So first I'm going to say, well, while k divided by 3, that's going to be log 3 of k. So if I have 27, 27 divided by 3 is 9, 9 divided by 3 is 3, 3 divided by 1 is 1. From there, this becomes 2 times m is in the loop. So it becomes 2 times m times log base 3 of k. Everybody see that? So then we can say oh, the constant is 2, therefore n log 3 of n using that equation, like so. Our guess is c is equal to 2. And therefore, we plug that into the equation, and we get n squared. We see it in red, n times log base 3 of n. So in this course, any problem that I give you, it will be reasonable to be able to figure out the constants. You won't have to do anything uh, excessive. I won't make you do runtime analysis on memoization. You need recurrence relations to do that. All right, does anybody have any questions? All right, so what I would like you to do next, okay, so we do have questions. Why four and not three? So four, so three n squared, we ha it has to be, f of n has to be less than or equal to c times g of n, right? So this was 3n squared plus log of n. And we have to figure out a constant that makes this, where this value has to be less than or equal to. So if I put 3, this becomes 3n squared, and it no longer meets our condition. So Emery, did that address your question? All right. So what I would like you to do next is bring up code, and you're going to do problems two and three. So to make everything consistent so we can do problems and coding in the lecture, if you run problem, make problem two, it will bring up the problem. So it's, it has some code, and it's asking you to say what the run, big O runtime is. And so enter your choice, like Linux, answer is case sensitive. So I'm going to pick A, because I know A is the wrong answer. And just once you get it, do that for problems two and three. You cannot ignore, the, so the question is, why can you, can you just ignore the log? I did not ignore the log. The log was multiplied. The solution was n times log three of n. That was the solution. So it was not ignored, it was accounted for. Simran, did that address your question? I'm sorry, what? No, we did not ignore it there either. We had to, that's why we had to do four and not three. Because if you ignore the log, then you could just make the constant three. But if you, because you're adding log two of n, the mo if when log, uh, let's say log, let's, let's pick four, right? So that becomes two, three times n squared, that's uh, three times four is 12, plus two is six, uh, 14. Three n squared then becomes 12. So we're saying is 14 less than or equal to 12? And that fails. 
So that's why we had to do four because we, precisely because we had to account for log, the log two n. Did that, did that address your question? Awesome. Okay, so when you have both of them, please give me a thumbs up. All right, lots of thumbs up. Okay, so who would like to tell me the answer to problem two? Yes. C is correct. N squared log N. Very good. So let me run make problem three. And what was the answer to this one? Yeah, in the back. B is correct. Very good. So we have N. This is log. N and this is N. So very good, outstanding work. Again, check LS. You should see problem one, problem two, and problem three text. That is proof that you've completed everything. So the next thing I wanna show you, I'm gonna take this big O notation and turn it on its head a little bit. So here's a common question. So here I have a quick note on, nested loops, and then I have math in scary font there. So this is a common student question. I have a for loop, i equals zero, i is less than array size, plus plus i, and then for j is equal to zero, j is less than i, and that's the crucial thing, j, uh, j plus plus. And the common question is, isn't this implementation not big O of n log n? And I'll say it's n squared. As soon as it will wait, that doesn't make sense. That I get smaller. I, I don't, I'm not figuring things out here. Let's please direct me in the right direction. It turns out it is actually n squared. So what's going to happen is the first loop, it'll go from while j is equal to i, so it'll only go one. But if j is two, it'll do two. J, i is three. It'll keep going while j is less than i. Does that make sense? So then for one operation, it goes one inner loop, but 40, it will do 40 inner loops. And then to prove it, that pattern follows a Taylor series. You may recognize those from calculus. So what ends up happening is it becomes n times n plus one divided by two. And then when you use that equation, we can then say n squared plus n divided by two, the constant, it will always be less than three n squared. So therefore I may claim that it's big O of n squared. So one of the interesting things about your programming experience up to this point, you write stuff, you put it in the, in the magic block, in magic box, it does a bunch of stuff, right? And you're like, oh, this is awesome. I love coding. And then your data structures professor goes, surprise, computer science is a math degree. Sorry, right? And I scare everybody like that. So the reason why I wanna point that out is because a lot of what you're gonna be doing, am I the only person who's that? A lot of what you're going to be doing in computer science involves mathematical justification. The other thing you have to bear in mind is that there's a real world. And in the real world, we can't always count on people doing what we want to do with the code. It's one of the reasons why we always have const and call by reference because, and this rule of three, because people aren't always going to do what we want them to do. No matter how much we beg, <clears throat> no matter how much we beg, no matter how much we justify uh, claim. So here I have an example of a data structure we're going to learn later called a red black tree. And in this red black tree, it has it's a search tree. So if I'm trying to find the value five, I say, well, five is less than ten. Five is greater than four. There it is. And it turns out this is log of n search time. Now that's all well and good if the values are being asked for in a distributed way. But let's say for some reason, some, the person just keeps asking for two, just over and over again. We lose the benefit of the data structure because the worst case scenario is always asked for. And so what we need to do is we need to think of what happens when somebody throws a wrench in our best in our best plan. We have to account for that in our design. And the way I want you to think of it is I want you to think of things as building up credit. 
most of the time in a specific data structure, it works really fast. However, in order to get that fast operation, I have to have an occasional operation that's not so good. And so your analysis of the runtime of that operation accounts for all of the good and all of the bad. And this particular type of operation of this analysis where we design data structures that trade per operation efficiency for overall efficiency. And this analysis is known as asymptotic analysis. So one analogy that I would encourage you to think of is doing dishes. So doing dishes, there's two ways to do it. You can either use a dishwasher or you can wash them by hand. If you wash it by hand, you're taking all this time to do it, but then the moment the dish is clean, it's available for use. If you use a dishwasher, you aren't doing the work, but all of the dishes are done at the same time. So you have to wait for them to be available. Does that make sense? So now it becomes, well, what is it that I really want? Do I want the availability to do other tasks or do I want the dishes to be available immediately? And so this is where we bring in a moratized analysis. So this math equation, here, I have a set of operations that are measured by a specific amount of time. And I'm going to break down what this fancy equation means. It means for every possible operation, that's what's in green, the amortized cost for any operation will be greater than the cost for all the possible actual operations. So what this means, and so let me give you an example to kind of put that in perspective. So let's say I have nine operations that take one second and one operation that takes 10 seconds. And so no matter how many times I use this thing for per 10 operations, it's gonna take, nine will take one and one will take 10. So the total is 19 seconds. And so the simplest way to break it down is 19 divided by 10 is 1.9. So my amortized time per operation is 1.9. So you can think of it as the average. The benefit of thinking about amortized analysis is what happens when I have an occasional worst case scenario. Does that make sense? So big O notation gives me the worst case scenario in all cases for some code I've written. And amortized analysis allows me to come up with an average time where I get a specific benefit where I, in order to get that benefit, I have to have an occasional trade-off. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so what I would like you to do is I want you to work on problems four and five. Problem four is an amortized analysis math problem. And problem five is picking out which one is the true benefit. So please take two minutes to work on those. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so who would like to tell me the answer to problem number four? Yes. 
C is correct. Eight times 0.5 is four, two times three is six, four plus six is 10. There are 10 total operations. 10 divided by 10 is one. C is the correct answer. What about problem five? Which one of these is the benefit of a moratized analysis? Yes. A is correct. Design data structures that trade per operation efficiency for overall efficiency. Please. Now, so good job. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this knowledge and we are going to go over the design of a vector. A vector in general parlance is known as a dynamic array. And so a dynamic array builds upon the idea of a static array. A static array, we use malloc, we cast it to some type and it's a specific amount of memory that can't be changed no matter what we do. So it's static. And so the formal definition, a homogeneous collection of data in a statically allocated memory space on the data heap. So, sorry. So what we're gonna do is, what can we do? We can use encapsulation to reallocate the memory in real time. And so all the user has to use is dot pushback to put an element at the end or dot at to update a specific location. So this is known as a dynamic array. And so the way it works is you have some sort of initial size. The initial size of a, of a vector is zero. And we're gonna learn how we build it from zero to one, to two, to four, to eight, to 16, and so on. So we insert four elements and everything's fine. So now if somebody wants to call pushback, what we're gonna do is we're gonna double the size of the array and then we're going to put in more elements. So there's a worst case scenario where two n minus one is used by the dynamic array. So there's, that's the trade-off between a dynamic array and linked lists. Linked lists only use the amount of memory that's needed. Whereas vectors, dynamic arrays, use worst case double. But you have direct access. So it's faster to access more memory. So it really depends on your application. So a few of you were talking about, uh, we were talking in office hours about the Mars rover. Mars rover, very limited memory. Furthermore, we can't send somebody out to Mars to just reset it, right? Millions of miles. So we have to make sure that we are not, we are very in control of the memory. That's why what we've been working on with, uh, with lists is really important. Memory management, understanding what's going on, limited environments, aerospace, for those of you who are interested in defense sectors, automotive, where you have these embedded systems with really small chips that are monitoring several things. That requires memory as well. So the, a question in the Slack, for a moratized runtime, do we always divide by 10? No, you divide by the number of operations. So if that had been 11, so let's say I had nine times 0.5, so that becomes 4.5. And then I had the two operations, two times three is six, that becomes 10.5 divided by 11 is the amortized runtime. On an exam, if I give you, when I give you a question like that, it will be something that's easy to divide and will not require the use of a calculator. So that's why I have it like that. I mean, did that address your question? Awesome. Okay, so next thing I want you to look at while I am presenting is that I have my data structure built into several files. They build upon each other in pieces. So not only do I want you to see how the data structure is, used, is being used, I want you to see how it is that I designed it into pieces so that way when I had a specific piece, I know that data structure, it's a dynamic array five doesn't work, everything up to four did, so therefore must, my mistake must have been somewhere in this particular aspect of it. So, in dynamic array one, all I have is the private members and just a regular constructor, right? So I have an int, length, capacity, and data, and that's it. The private members are unsigned int length. I keep track of the length, which is the current number of elements in the dynamic array, and the capacity, which is the si overall size that I've allocated. And then I have T star data. So it's actually a static array inside. And there's my constructor. And then 
we see that the last thing I used the new keyword, but that's just the C++ version of using malloc. So all the things that we learned about void pointers, we're revisiting them again. I have a pointer inside a class with a template and a generic. In dynamic array two, I've added a destructor. I have a private member that's pointing, so I have to delete it. So what I have there is a specific line of code. And here I have my full thing, but this is what I've written in there. I have delete and I've deleted the array with data. So this notation is there for you. What this is doing is it's deleting the pointer and the associated memory. Does that make sense? So that's the destructor. So now we have a rule of three. So now we need a copy constructor and assignment operator. Same thing as amortized analysis. Do not always think the best case scenario is gonna happen. Copy constructors and op assignment operators are there in the event that somebody using your code doesn't use it precisely how you want. So how do we copy the value? What I've done here is I have a private method called copy. And in this private method, what I'm doing is I have a pointer from destination and a pointer origin. So I have two dynamic arrays and I'm pointing to the memory that's allocated. And then I'm iterating through the length and then I copy the value. Now, the only reason I've done what I did at line 20 is to reinforce that pointer arithmetic and the array operations are the same thing. The, th the code on the left and the code on the right of the assignment operator are the same. Does that make sense? So when I use that, I can use that method in both my copy constructor and my assignment operator. So this is kind of a shortcut so I don't have to keep uh, reusing code. So in my copy, in my uh, assignment operator, I do the same thing if this is not equal to assign. I have the length and capacity. Data equals new T data, right? Because now I'm, I'm allocating a new dynamic array. And then I call the origin, which is copy dot, uh, date, copy dot data, I'm sorry, assign dot data. And then data is the local copy. So I'm copying from the origin to the destination. For the assignment operator, I'm doing the same thing. Just call the copy method, except it's copy.data. So now I have a few more methods that I'll just briefly go over. And this allows me to access. So you know when you're doing the bracket operator? That is an operator that's here in this code. And we call by reference because this can allow you to manipulate it. That's what's actually going on when you have an array. It's actually called by reference and you can do this. But let's say I have a constant array. So therefore, I wrote a different version of begin and end with const to ensure that if I wrote a constant array, it wouldn't be changed. And then I have two methods for size and capacity that return this as well. So I make a little note here that production quality compilation rules do not allow methods and private members to have the same name. So when I run make, uh, and you have this too, if I run make dynamic array test bot bad, it gives me all these errors. And that's why, because it doesn't match up. So in dynamic array six, I wrote this overloaded operator. You can do the overloaded operator for the brackets, just like we've done with arrays. And here I have data I, and then I'm calling by reference. This allows me to change that value if someone decides to change it. But I have a const version. If I have, let's say if I pass the dynamic array as const to another, like a print value, I wouldn't want the user to be able to change it. So I've written another version. Uh, 
Okay, and so there's a simple example. I've created the dynamic array. I know that my array operator uh, works. So I've created zero through six, I print it out, and then I print them this, the same here and do the results. So what I would like to do for the last five minutes is put the dynamic in dynamic array. We've written an operator, we've allocated memory, but now we actually have to demonstrate how it is that we're going to reallocate memory. And so what I would like you to do, so what we have to do, oh, I'm sorry, this is a crucial point. The crucial thing to bear in mind with an operating system is that if I have a certain amount of memory, I may not be able to automatically just put more memory there. Somewhere else in the program or another program may have grabbed that memory. In operating system, when you take the operating systems course, you're going to learn a lot about things called paging and segmentation, about how to regulate memory and where things go and why. The crucial thing you need to know for this is that there's no guarantee that if I double it, that memory will be available. So what I need to do is we're actually going to make another copy somewhere else on the data heap, double the length, and then put everything there. So the code that we're going to write together is how we're going to do this. And so what I would like you to do, come on, there we go. So if I run capacity here, I allocate the memory. I do the operator. This makes us three, two, eight, and four. All right, so I make another one. There's the copy. For, forgive me for going a little faster through these. This allows me to do copy constructor like so. Okay, I would just explain that. So what I'd like you to do is go to include dynamic array.h and please go to line 99. And this will be the last thing we do together. And so at line 99, you're gonna see this problem six starts here. And so there's a first case, we always check to see if we've reached or exceeded the capacity. So we're gonna say, if the length is greater than or equal to capacity, and that's C-A-P-A-C. -A -A and so what I would like you to do is just leave that if statement blank, and we're gonna account for the non-empty version. And that's just, okay, we have the memory already allocated. So I can just say data length is equal to value. And then I need to increment the number by saying length plus plus. So that's the simple version. What's gonna happen inside this if statement is the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check to see if I have an empty dynamic array. And the way I do that is just to say, if the length is equal to zero, I'm then gonna change the capacity to one. Right. What I'm gonna do next is if the length was not zero, we're gonna multiply the capacity by two. So it'd be zero, one, two, four, eight, if for some reason it started out at seven, it will become 14. So make an else and then capacity equals capacity times two. Come on, go away. So now that we have a create, a increase the number for the capacity, we actually have to show the new capacity. And the way we do that is we're gonna create a temporary pointer and we're gonna allocate that new memory. So we're gonna say T star, I'm gonna call it temp, TMP, is equal to new, that's gonna be array of the templated T, and I'm gonna say capacity. So now I'm setting up to create a new array that's double the length of the previous array. Does that make sense? So then the last part is, okay, well, I have temp and I have the current data. Why don't I just say, all right, I'm gonna use that copy method. So now I'm gonna copy everything over. Temp is the destination, data is the origin, 
and the length is the current length of data. Does that make sense? And then there's two last things, and then this will work. One, we are going to delete the old data. When we delete the old data, we're going to use that notation that I showed you a little earlier. We're going to say delete bracket data. So that was the old version. And then we're going to update. We've deleted the memory allocated to it, but we still have that data pointer. That's what that bracket there means. And now I can say data is equal to temp. And after we hit that bracket at line, what I have was line 116, it will go out of scope and it will work. All right, does that make sense? So while you're finishing that up, I'm gonna save it and show you how it compiles. And you can do make dynamic array test. And you should see that the original array is zero and has a final capacity of six. And if you see that, you will see prob six text will show up. So let me show you what I would like you to do to conclude. Once you have this done, once you have prob one through prob six, when you run the script test.sh, all it's gonna do is check to see if those files exist. But the other thing it's gonna do is if you've properly checked out to the CCO4 branch, it's gonna run the git commands for you. So when you run test.sh, deleting the text files, and then uh, the student machines are nightmarish. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, full credit, deleting them. Yours should work, and the reason why, okay, so it's deleted it, and you should see a vim grade dot out. And that's what it will look like. Okay. And then, What's going to happen at the end of this test script, and then after I show you this, I'll dismiss. It's going to run git add, git lecture commit. So it should be working for you, though the student machines have been something uh, recently. But if you run um, git add all, okay, so git is another, another git process is common. All right, so when you run it, it will work. Either that or when you push this for your coding challenge for the grade dot out is what the TA will see when you are um, running the, uh, when you upload that, the TA who grades your coding challenge for will make sure that your lecture 09 assignment is also there. So all the code is available on the course page. So if you had some sort of compiler issue or a question, you're welcome to do that through midnight tonight to clarify or fix. If you have 150, it should run everything for you. And on that note, does anybody have any final questions? All right, on that note, uh, it is time for you to be dismissed. Okay, uh, can you guys let me set everything up, go close everything up? All right, thank you. <laughs>